What I'd like to do now is to spend some time exploring the ICC. I want you to get a more intuitive feel for how it works and uh, then move from there to talking about how you can actually incorporate this into your planning for the, uh, for the study. Let's uh, set up, we'll start with the two-level study because I, I think that's going to keep this simpler and it's enough to make the points that I need to make. I'm going to right click over here. We're going to call this schools and we're going to call this students. And for purposes of talking about the ICC, it probably would be helpful if I actually go in and put in values over here. Let's assume that we're talking about the SAT again. So the overall mean for the control group is going to be 500 and the span is going to be 360. This is, represents a standard deviation of 90 points. Right, the span is four standard deviations, and that's the span of uh, student scores within a single school. And um, again, our, our goal over here is to compare the means in the treated group versus the control group. Now, for any given effect size, power is going to depend on how precisely we can estimate the mean difference. And that, in turn, depends on how precisely we can estimate the mean for the control group and how precisely we can estimate the mean for the treated group. The, the, the precision with which we can estimate the difference depends on the precision with which we can estimate each of those two means. Now, if you think back to a simple randomized study, the precision with which we can estimate the mean, let's talk about the mean in the control group, the same thing is going to apply to the treated group. The precision with which we can estimate the mean in the control group is going to depend on two things. The first thing it's going to depend on is how widely or narrowly the, um, the mean varies, let's say, from, from school to school. In other words, if all of the um, or from student to student. If we're talking about a, uh, a simple randomized trial where we're simply sampling students, if all the student scores fall in a fairly narrow range in the control group, then we don't need a really large sample size to estimate that mean accurately. We can get by with a smaller sample size. So for example, if uh, the mean score for students in the control group is 500, and uh, all of the scores for the sake of argument fell within 20 or 30 points of that, then even with a fairly modest sample size, we'd be able to accurate, would be able to estimate that mean fairly accurately. By contrast, if the scores fall across a broader range, if they, if they have a standard deviation of, of, of um, 15, I'm sorry, of 100 points, so they actually range for the most part from as low as, as um, 300 to as far as high as, as 700, then we're going to need, need a larger sample size to estimate that mean accurately. The same thing applies at the school level. If the school means all fall within a very narrow range, if there's very little variation in mean from school to school, then we're going to be able to estimate the mean for a school with even a relatively small number of schools. By contrast, if the mean varies substantially from one school to the next, then we're going to need more schools to get an accurate estimate of the, um, of the school mean for all, for all means in the control group. And this is just, it's a very intuitive thing. If, it, you know, if, if, if the school means, you know, if the, some of them are as low as 400 and others are as high as, as 600, when the, the, the overall true value is 500, you can't just pick one or two schools for the control group and one or two schools for the treated group. It might be that just by chance you happen to pick two schools for the control group that have unusually low means. You need to have enough schools so that the error uh, diminishes and that the mean of your sample is going to be a pretty close approximation to the true mean. Now, to show how this works, um, Remember what we're, going to, we're trying to do over here is to estimate the mean for the treated group and estimate the mean for the control group. There are going to be two sources of error. One source of error is going to be the error within schools, and the second source of error is going to be the error between schools. So for the purposes of this exercise, where I'm trying to show you how the ICC affects the precision, 
So we're talking about the, the error, the sampling error that's coming into the school level. What I want to do is, is pretty much minimize the error at the student level. So I'm simply going to bump up the number of students until we have 500 students per, um, let's even make it 1,000 students per Per school. So basically what we're saying over here is that there's essentially going to be no error at the student level. The only error that we're going to be concerned with in this hypothetical exercise is the error at the school level. And initially we're setting the ICC at zero, which means that there's no error at the school level. That the true value for each school, the true mean for each school is actually 500. In which case it really doesn't matter whether we have two schools or 50 because any school that we pick is going to have the same true mean. Let's put in an effect size of 0.3. Immediately the uh, power jumps up to 99% because we have essentially no error at the student level because we have a large number of students. And we also have no error, no sampling error at the school level because all schools have the same true mean. So even with just two um, schools in the treated group and two schools in the control group, we're able to estimate the mean for the treated group with great accuracy, and we're able to estimate the mean for the control group with no accuracy. Therefore, power is going to be exceptionally high. And just to show you what this looks like, um, if I go to ICC, schematic always on, we can see over here that there's, with an ICC of zero, uh, the, the range of school means, of true school means, is 500 to 500, which means essentially there is no variation over there, and therefore no sampling error. Now let's see what happens if we increase that. Let's say that we said the ICC is 0. 0.1. Which means that the um, which means that the mean in the control group, the school means vary from 440 to 560. Uh, by simply moving the ICC from 0 to 0 0.1, power now went from 90 percent to 9 percent. What we're saying over here is that if you have um, If you have the means in the control group, the school means varying over this range of scores, then you can't get by with only two schools because I mean, the reason should be obvious. You might, for the control group, it might happen to pick two schools down here, and you're going to be underestimating the mean by 50 or 60 points. And for the treatment group, you might happen to pick two schools up here and be overestimating the mean by 50 or 60 points or vice versa. The point is you cannot get an accurate estimate. Just, just the same way that in a sample of students where the scores vary over 120 points, you can't expect to get a decent estimate of the mean with only two students. By this, exactly the same logic, if you have schools where the means vary over 120 points, you can't expect to get a decent estimate of the mean with only two schools. And again, over here, because I've included so many students within each school, when, once we pick a school, we're going to know the, the, the mean for that school with great accuracy. But the problem is, well, we know the mean for that school with great accuracy. That school doesn't tell us a lot about the mean for all schools. So that's the point. So as soon as the ICC is 0.1, power is going to drop to 0 0.09. The only way to deal with it, you can address this by increasing the number of students because that's not relevant. That's going to give us a more accurate estimate of the mean for, by bumping up the number of our students to 2,000 or 3,000, we're going to get a more accurate estimate of the mean for each school that we've chosen. But that's not where the error is. The error is in the fact that we've only sampled two schools and that doesn't give us the kind of information that we need. What we need to do is to increase the number of schools. And you can see that as the number of schools goes to three, power begins to go up. And if we bump up the number of schools to, well, to 19 per treatment, power is now back at, is, it is at 80%. What happens if the ICC is not 0.1, but it's 0.20? Well, immediately again, the um, power is now down to 52 percent. 
Again, the way to increase it would be to increase the number of schools. And now we need to bump that up to, well, we need to bump it up to about 37 schools per group to get power back up to 80%. So you can see that as the ICC went from 0 to 0.10 to 0.20, uh, the number of schools that we needed to get decent power went from 2 to 19 to 37, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly. That's the way that the ICC impacts on power. Now, the problem is, um, what do you use for the ICC? Uh, typically, you're going to approach this from one of, of two points of view. In some cases, you might be able to go to, to, go to the literature and to see that in studies of this kind, working with this kind of population, there's evidence that the ICC is some number, let's say 0.1 or 0.2. Uh, what the program allows you to do is to put that number in, and you can see what that corresponds to uh, in, in using um, actual scale values on your scale, and you can figure whether or not that's plausible. Alternatively, you might start by working with the scale values. You might say, well, I know that in studies of this kind, I can expect the school means to vary from 410 to 590. You plug that in, and you see that it corresponds to an ICC of 0.20. And then you might be able to go back to the literature and see that people actually have reported an ICC in that range. So you have a sense that this ICC is reasonable. But even here, you probably don't know for sure exactly what that ICC is going to be. You're going to have a range of possible ICCs. And in some cases, you might not have even this much information. For example, you might have information from some studies that you've run previously, but maybe there is no published estimates of the ICC for this kind of population or this kind of test. So what you need to do is to work with a range of ICCs and say, well, you know, if the ICC is actually 0.10, then this is the sample size that I'd need. If it's actually 0.15, this is the sample size that I'd need. And if it's actually 0.20, this is the sample size that I'd need. As I showed you, you can do that working with the main screen, but it's probably going to be somewhat easier if you're using a graph, which puts all of this in context, just to get some basic Starting numbers, I'm going to click the Optimal Design Wizard, Compute. Ah, I neglected to put in costs over here, so let me do that. Let's say that we're expecting schools to cost $2,000 a piece, and we are expecting students to cost, let's say, $50 a piece. Click the Optimal Design Wizard. Click Compute. The program comes up with a version of this study that's going to give me power of 80% at a cost of $160,000. Now I click Graph, and the program shows me that uh, as the number of schools per condition, this is the number we were looking at a minute ago, 27 schools in each condition, I'm going to have power of, um, of 80%. But um, let's get a sense of how this is related to the ICC. I'm going to come back over here and for the x-axis, which is this axis over here, uh, rather than having the x-axis be the number of schools per condition, let's assume that we're, we, we're pretty much fixed on using um, 27 students. Let me come back over here for a second. We'd set this up with 27 schools per condition, so that's the value we're going to be starting with. Let me assume we're going to work with 27 schools per condition, and I'm going to set the x-axis to ICC for schools. And you can see what happens. With ICC for, uh, with, with this fixed at um, 27 per group, which we see down here, now this axis is being used as the ICC. If the actual ICC is 0.1, then power is going to be 80. But as we move the ICC to the right, if the ICC hits 0.2, then power is only 60%, and if the ICC hits 0.3, power is only 46%. So you can get a sense of how um, variations in the ICC are going to affect the power. Let's assume that we're fairly certain the ICC falls someplace in this range between 0.1 and 0.2. Well, what we're saying then is that the, um, the power uh, could be as high as 80%, but could also be as low as 60%. And that one we might want to do is to um, power for this 
In other words, set the, um, the number of schools to ensure that power is good, even with an ICC of 0.2, and see what happens with an ICC of 0.1. Um, I use this graph just to sort of show you the relationship between ICC and power, but let's come back over here. We're going to reset this axis to be the number of schools, and then we're going to add a second series inside, which is the ICC. I'm going to click Add to add one more. We had an ICC of 0.1. We're going to add an ICC of 0.15, and finally an ICC of 0.20. We're going to click OK. And now we get three lines inside over here. And you can see what happens. Um, in this range that we were looking at before, this is the um, number that we saw before. Let's come back over here to get power of 80%. I'm sorry. We're supposed to be looking at an ICC of 0.1 to get power of 80 percent we had 27 schools per group if that is the number of schools we decide to go with if the ICC is actually for is actually 0.15 and we can use these arrows to move up and down then the power would be 68 percent and if it's actually 0.20 power would be only about 60 percent so let's say that we decide to plan the study in power for the middle ICC which is 0.15 we can come up here we can move to the right and we can see that we would need 35 schools per, um, per group to ensure 80% power with this middle ICC. If we did that and the ICC was actually 0.2, then power would be 71%. And if it was actually 0.1, then power would be about 90%. So we might decide, well, you know, um, we, it would be difficult to power for this ICC, for the ICC of 0.20, because in that case we would, need, uh, we would need 44 schools, and that might be too expensive. Therefore, we'll power for the red line. Or we might decide, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's reasonable that the ICC could be as high as 0.20. Therefore, we want to power for this line over here. We're going to have to go with 44 schools. Obviously, the important question is, how much are these things going to cost? We can come back over here, click on Cost, Show Cost in Graph, so we know exactly what we're talking about. And just to make this a little bit easier, we don't really need to this part of the graph over here. Uh, it's pretty clear we're going to be dealing with some number less than 60 per um, less than 60 uh, schools per group. So I'm going to come back over here, click on the series, modify the range for the x-axis use a customized range, and we're going to go from, let's say, 2 up to 60. Click OK. So now it's just a little bit easier to work with. Okay, if we decide, we've already decided we're not going to power for the ICC of 0.1. That's simply too risky. If we decide to power for the ICC of 0.15 to get power of 80%, we would need... 35 schools, that's the same thing we saw before. The cost would be 200, approximately $206,000. That's the number that we see over here, which aligns with this axis over here, and we have the exact number over here. That's about 200, let's, let's call that $206,000. On the other hand, if we decide to power for this, then we would need, we're just going to keep on clicking on this until this hits 80%. We're going to need 44 schools, and the cost would be $260,000. So to power for this line, rather than this one, we're going to need approximately another $55,000. And the point then is to decide whether or not we want to spend that extra money to ensure good power for this. There's one other thing that we can do, however. And let me take you back to the main screen to show you how this works. Um, we're working over here now with a design where we have 19 students per school and 27 schools. Now, remember, uh, what we're doing when we're increasing the number of schools is we're also increasing the, the total number of students. And this 
design makes the most sense if when we were planning for an ICC of 0.10. But if we're going to come back over here, let's bump this up to 0.20 for a minute and then click optimal design and click compute. It turns out in this case, um, once we're planning for an ICC of 0.20, because we're going to be increasing the number of schools, we really no longer need 19 students per school. We'd be okay with only 13 students per school. And the reason is that when you multiply 47 times 13, you're going to come out with approximately the same number of students as we had before when we were dealing with a lower ICC and we were multiplying a smaller number times this. So in that, in that case, we needed 19 students per school. Let's come back over here again and look at the graph and see what happens. In this case, with only 13 students per school, if we wanted a power for the light blue line and move this out until we get power of 80%, uh, in this case, the cost would be $250,000 rather than $260,000 as it was last time. So my point is simply that once you start realizing that you want to power for a higher ICC, it pays to go back and see how, can, how you can manipulate some of the other numbers. And the easiest way to do that is to use the optimal design wizard on the other page, $1,000. My point is simply that you want to use the graph to get a better understanding of what your options are. But you also always, once you've, you're, you're thinking about the final decision, you want to come back and figure out if once you've decided that you want to power for an ICC of 0.20, you need to come back and revisit some of the other numbers. And the same idea works, of course, if you have a three-level or a four-level study. I'm not going to run through an example of that. My main goal over here had been to give you a more intuitive feel of how the ICC um, works, and I hope that I've accomplished that. Please let me know. I could use feedback on whether this was clear. If it is not, I'm perfectly happy to go ahead and make an additional video focusing on this. If it was clear, I'd like to know that as well. I wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing the potential impact of blocking. Let's come back over here. Let's assume again that we're working with schools as clusters and students as subjects. When we start off with a situation where we are randomizing at the top level, so each school is assigned either to the treated group or the control group, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be computing the mean for these schools and the mean for these schools, and then we're going to compute the difference. So intuitively, um, the precision of this estimate is going to depend on how much variation there is in school means and the number of schools. And similarly, the precision of this estimate is going to depend on how much variation there is in school means and the number of schools. So if we're dealing with the situation as we are in the current example, where the control group, again, we're going to assume has a mean of 500, which is the mean for the SAT. The span of scores for students within a school is about 360 points. And let's say the ICC is 0.20. We're saying that the uh, school means vary across schools where you might have some schools where the mean is as low as 410 and other schools where the mean is as high as 590. In order to get a, uh, an, a decent estimate of um, the mean for all schools in the control group, obviously you can't get by with one or two schools because it's easy to see that the mean um, for those for the mean for one school could easily be off by as much as 90 points from the true mean. But what we need to do is to increase the number of schools. And we discovered earlier that you probably would need as many as um, 40 schools to get a decent estimate of the mean. So if I get rid of a lot of the, uh, let's say I get rid of most of the um, student level sampling error by putting some high number in here, and if we set the uh, effect size over here to 0 0.3, which is you know a, a uh, reasonable effect size probably for some kinds of interventions, 
we see that we would need to get the number of schools up to around I'm going to right click over here just so I can see the power we would need to get the number of schools up to about um, thirty seven per group to get power of eighty percent and again the reason is we have if we're looking at just at the control group means the school means vary over a very wide range um, of a hundred and um, eighty points we need to have enough schools to ensure that any schools that are above the mean are going to be balanced by schools below the mean and we'll be able to get a reasonably accurate estimate of the of the overall mean which in this case we're saying is um, is 500. Now how do we improve this if we use blocking? Let me reiterate one of the points which I made in the um, in the materials that I gave out last week. Uh, in general you're going to get better uh, power when you're able to block um, at a higher level as compared to as compared to randomizing at that level. Um, that's not always going to be the case but in the in the certainly in the in the majority of cases probably the vast majority of cases that's going to be the case however um, that doesn't mean that we can use blocking on a regular basis the reason that we that we randomize at the higher level level is often one of the reasons that we randomize at the higher level is that um, is that is that blocking is simply not a, a, um, a viable solution and the example of that we're using over here where we're trying an intervention that's going to increase SAT scores it might be the case that it, it's difficult to go into a school and give half the kids vouchers for uh, tutoring and not give vouchers to the other half of the kids because the problem is the kids that are not getting vouchers they're they're going to be very upset that other kids are being given an advantage that they're not being given so therefore to go into a school and assign and use blocking and assign half the kids to get the vouchers and half the kids not to get it is simply not going to work and for that reason we need to go to some schools uh, where we give out vouchers and other schools where we don't uh, another problem that we might have is contamination uh, if we're coming in for example with some kind of a an intervention that involves some kind of additional um, help for, for the kids the kids that are getting the help might share their knowledge with kids that, that are not getting the help and therefore the impact of the intervention is diluted uh, another thing is that these we might be talking about treatments which if they are implemented in the real world after the study is completed are going to be implemented at the school level so if we decide that vouchers work we're going to give them out um, to uh, entire schools and so we want more of a sense of how these are actually going to work in the uh, in the real world in any event the primary factor determining whether or not we can use blocking is often going to be whether or not it is a uh, plausible solution a plausible approach which depends on the content but assuming that we're working with an intervention which can be administered at the student level or can be administered at the school level so that we have the choice of randomizing schools or blocking schools how much of a difference is blocking going to make uh, keeping in mind that we're using a specific example over here and the example is probably somewhat realistic what would happen if we come back now and block well the idea is that when we've randomized schools we're computing first of all we're computing the mean for this group and second we're computing the mean for this group so the precision depends on how accurately we can estimate both of each of those means and the problem that we're trying to address is that when we assign some schools to the control condition if those schools happen to have an unusually low mean or an unusually high mean they're going to pull the um, they're going to pull the mean for the for the entire control group in fact even if they have like a you know a modestly low mean or a modestly high I mean the point is if the mean is not exactly 500 they're going to pull the estimate for the control group in one direction or the other and the same thing for the treated group but what happens when we block is that we don't have some schools assigned to one and some schools assigned to the other if we decide to randomize students so that schools are blocked what happens now is that each school gets both conditions so if each school gets both conditions then in effect what we're going to be doing is we're going to go into a school and compute the difference in that school between treated and control 
Well, since we're only dealing with the difference, let's say for the sake of argument, we happen to pick a school that has a mean of 410, way out at the extreme. It doesn't affect the precision of our estimate because now what we're estimating is not the mean for the treated group, nor the mean for the control group. Rather, what we're estimating is the difference between those two means. And if the um, treated group scores 50 points higher, so that we have a control group with a mean of 410 and a treated group with a mean of, of 460, um, it doesn't matter whether we happen to pick a school where the mean is 410 or we happen to pick a school where the mean is 590. The only thing that matters is the difference between the groups, and it doesn't matter what the mean is. So the fact that the mean varies from school to school completely falls out of the equation. The only thing that we need to care about um, is how much the difference varies from school to school. Let's come back over here for a minute and talk about the span of the effects. So we're talking about a um, the effect size D. If it was the case that the intervention had exactly the same effect um, from one school to the next, then really all that we would need to do is include one or two schools in the analysis, compute the difference in those schools, and we would know, and as long as we have a sufficient sample size in those schools, so there's no er sampling error at the student level, we would know the, the, the mean difference exactly. Um, what happens instead, of course, in real life, is that it is not the case that the effect size is exactly the same in each school. Rather, what's going to happen is that there are going to be some schools where the intervention is more effective and some schools where the intervention is less effective. So let's say the span of the effects, I think the example that I used earlier was that the, the effects span, let's say, 0.30, which means that if we look at all of the schools in the population, there might be some um, where the, if we're saying the overall effect size is a d-value of 0.3, there might be some schools where the effect size is only 0.15, and then there might be some schools where the effect size is as high as 0.45. So in raw numbers, what this means is that while the average effect size is, 50, is, is 30 points, there are some schools where the intervention increases the SAT score by fi only 15 points, and there's other schools where it increases the uh, SAT score by 45 points. So what happens now is we have to have enough schools so that um, so that we're able to get a good estimate of the um, of the effect size. So that if we happen to pick one or two schools where the the, the difference between treated and control was as low as 0.15, then we're going to offset that with a couple where it was as high as 0.45. So to get power up again. We need to increase this, and it turns out we need about, um, well, with four schools, we're going to have power up at 98%. Now, these numbers I'm going to argue are somewhat reasonable, but let's even say we change the span of effects and make it 0.5, which means that we have some schools where the effect size is as low as a five-point difference and others where it's as high as a 55-point difference we still get power of better than 80%. So why is it that when we, we uh, randomized schools, we needed something like 37 schools per group, but when we block, we need only four? Well, there's two things going on. The first thing is that look at the, look at the, the span of differences. In, in many cases, including I think in this example, it's reasonable to expect, experience tells us, that while the school mean might vary over a wide range, we said that it varied over a range of about, of about 120 points from school to school, the effect size is going to vary over a, a much smaller range. Over here we're saying it varies over a range of only 50 points, that if the average effect size is 0 0.30, that in, in it, it might range from a minimum of, um, I'm sorry, we said the average effect size is 30 points in raw units, 
that it might range from as little as 5 points to as much as 55 points. So it's ranging over 50 points. It's not ranging over 120 points. It's probably not plausible to expect a range of 120 points, which would mean that in some schools that the, the control group is doing better, substantially better. And in other schools, we have, we have a 100-point uh, you know, um, gain in scores. Because when you're looking at the means, I mean, the mean is affected by a whole host of things. It might be affected by the neighborhood the school is in, by the kids, by the teachers and, and, and other things. Whereas when we're looking at the effect size within a school, we're looking at the impact of the intervention and just the way these things work, it might be reasonable to expect that the intervention is going to have a reasonably consistent effect as we go from school to school. The other thing is that is, is more technical, but it's simply the fact that when we're dealing with uh, some schools that are assigned to treatment and other schools that are assigned to control, the precision of the difference is based on, on two errors. There's error in estimating the mean for the control condition. There's error in uh, estimating the mean for the treated condition. So we take those two errors, those two variances, and need to add them together. By contrast, when we are dealing with, um, with, uh, with blocking, um, we have only one source of error, which is the error of, of the difference. Another thing, when we come to thinking about uh, costs, is that um, in this case, we're talking about four schools in total. Before, we were talking not only about 37 schools, but 37 schools per group, which actually works out to about 75 schools altogether. So we can typically get uh, a much more cost-effective design when we are using uh, blocking. Let's see how what this actually translates to over here in dollars and cents. If I go back to the situation where I'm randomizing schools, and let's assume that each student is going to cost us $200, and that each school is going to cost us, let's say, $2,500. Uh, and I want to use the optimal design wizard, and I'm going to compute. The best that I can do is a study that's going to cost about $435,000. And we see that over here. By contrast, if I randomize um, students and block schools, and we say again that the cost is going to be about $2,500 per school, and now I use the optimal design wizard to compute this. I can come up with a study that costs only about $110,000. So we've basically saved about two-thirds of the potential cost to get the, same, um, to get the same power. Let me show you, by the way, that over here, um, once we have, uh, since we're using blocking, the ICC is still important. Um, it's still going to affect the power but not uh, in the way that you would expect. Remember, normally when the ICC um, goes up, the power is going to go down. In this case, as the ICC goes up, the power is actually going up a little bit. And it, at more to the point that has only a very trivial impact on power. The reason for that is that once we're blocking at this level, the ICC has no impact on the sampling error at this level. It simply falls out of the equation. However, if the ICC goes from 20 to 25 over here, that means that the proportion of variance at the student level is moving from 80% to 75%. In other words, the, the variance over here is actually going down because the variance over here is simply computed as 1 minus this. So if this goes up, this goes down, therefore power goes up. That's simply an aside. Uh, my, my main point is that once you're blocking at any level, the ICC, while it's still important to the overall computation, does not affect the sampling error at the, uh, at the school's uh, level. Let me show you, sort of iterate, um, highlight again the fact that this example that I gave you showed a major impact for an increase in power when we moved from using randomization over here to using blocking. That assumed that the ICC over here was 0.20 to begin with and that the span of the effects was relatively um, low or certainly by comparison. We certainly can imagine other situations where that's not going to be the case. 
if we came up with a case where the ICC was very low because the school means were very consistent. And by contrast, uh, we expect that a lot of variation in the effect size, then you probably would get very little or no um, in bump in power by moving from a, a randomized design to a blocked design. The same thing that I've showed you over here also applies when we move to three level or four level studies. Um, and in general, for example, for a four level study, you're going to get uh, the best power for the least money if you can block not only at the top level, but the top two levels or even at the top three levels. Again, with the caveats that I've mentioned, which is that the ICC is high, relatively high, and the span of effects is relatively low. That's always the balance that we are looking at. Let's spend a minute over here and look at the potential impact of covariates. I have this study um, that we used earlier. Um, we have an ICC of 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0.12. The standardized mean difference is 0.3. Power is 80% at a cost of $770,000. And this is the most cost-effective study that we were able to design. What if we use covariates to reduce the error term? What if I put in a covariate over here that explains 50% of the variation in district means? I put in a covariate over here that explains 40% of the variation in school means. I have a covariate over here that explains 50% of the variation of class means within a school. And I have one over here that explains, let's say, 60% of the student-to-student -student variation within a class. So this might be, for example, if we're using the SAT example, this might be the district mean SAT score from the prior year. This might be the school's mean SAT score from the prior year. This might be the class's ranking within the school, within, within the school, and this might be the student's um, ranking within, uh, within their class. Uh, once I've put in these covariates, keeping everything else the same, you can see that power jumped considerably. If I come back here and look, the op look at the optimal design wizard and click compute and click paste and close, you can see that the program was now able to bring the cost down to about $400,000, a savings of about $300,000. Uh, simply by adding a few covariates. One thing that's very important to keep in mind is that when we're dealing with a level that is randomized or nested, randomized as, like this one is or nested as these are, the sampling error comes from the fact that the mean varies from district, district to district or that the mean varies from school to school within a district and so on. Therefore, the covariate has to be something that is related to the variation in means. So for example, over here, we might be looking at the uh, district mean on the SAT from the previous year. This might be the school mean on the SAT from the previous year. This might be the, um, the class ranking within a school, or this might be the student ranking within a class. By contrast, if we are using blocking um, at any level, then the sampling error is not coming from the fact that the means vary, it's coming from the fact that the effect size varies. So if we have over here a span of effects, let's say of 0.4, and we have here a span of effects of 0.4, these covariates would need to be something that addresses the fact that the uh, effect size it, varies from school to school, that the impact of the intervention varies from school to school, or over here that the impact of the intervention varies from district to district. So that might be, for example, let's say we're talking about districts. Um, you might expect that the uh, intervention, if what we're doing is giving uh, tutoring on the SAT, that the intervention might be less effective uh, the impact might be less pronounced in districts with a relatively high SES because perhaps in those districts these families are already providing some kind of tutoring and therefore the incremental effect of the, uh, of the intervention is going to be smaller. Or in schools, um, it, I mean it might be something similar. The point is that the R-square is no longer addressing something that looks at the variation in means rather 
it is looking at something that looks at the at the um, at, at at the variance in the uh, impact of the um, of the intervention. And just to put some final uh, some closure on this, and and just to sort of come full circle, we said that it was four thousand and two thousand are the costs over here. So if we bring the cost back up to four thousand for districts and um, and uh, two thousand for schools, so we're using blocking to reduce the costs, and uh, we use the optimal design wizard. It turns out that we can get the cost of the study down to two hundred thousand dollars. So by using covariates, we were able to knock the cost down by about 300,000, and that would typically be possible. I mean, there are no constraints on, on, on when we can and can't use covariates. If additionally we happen to be dealing with a situation where it was valid, it was plausible to use blocking, then we could have knocked the cost down by another 50%.